Hi Soul Church, today we're going to be reading from Judges 8, so please follow along in your Bibles. Then the men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you have done to us, not to call us when you went to fight against Midian? And they accused him fiercely. And he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abiza? God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger against him subsided when he said this. And Gideon came to the Jordan and crossed over, he and the three hundred men who were with him, exhausted yet pursuing. So he said to the men of Succoth, Please give the loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I am pursuing after Zebeth and Zalmanah, the kings of Midian. And the officials of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zabeth and Zalmanah already in your hand, that we should give the bread to your army? So Gideon said, Well then, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmanah into my hand, I will flail your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And from there he went up to Puenel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Puenel answered him and as the men of Succoth had answered. And he said to the men of Puenel, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmana were in Karkor with their army, about 15,000 men, all who were left of the army of the people of the east, for there had fallen 120,000 men who drew the sword. And Gideon went up by the way of the tent dwellers east of Nobath and Jegobath and attacked the army, for the army felt secure. And Zeba and Zalmana fled, and he pursued them and captured the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmana, and he threw all the army into a panic. Then Gideon the son of Joash returned from the battle of the as- by the ascent of Herods, and he captured a young man of Succoth and questioned him. And he wrote down for him the officials and elders of Succoth, seventy-seven men. And he came to the men of Succoth and said, Behold Zeba and Zalmana, about whom you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmana already in your hand that we should give bread to your men who are exhausted? And he took the elders of the city, and he took the thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them taught the men of Succoth a lesson. And he broke down the tower of Prenel and killed the men of the city. Then he said to Zeba and Zalmana, Where are the men whom you killed at Tabor? They answered, As you are, as you are, so are they. Every one of them resembled the son of a king. And he said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. So he said to Jephthah his firstborn, Rise and kill them. But the young man did not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a young man. Then Zeba and Zalmana said, Rise yourself and fall upon us, for as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon arose and killed Zabbath and Zalmana, and he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, and you and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. And Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they answered, We will willingly give them. And they spread a cloak, and every man threw in it the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garnets worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of their camels. And Gideon made an ephod out of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his family. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest for forty years in the days of Gideon. Jeroboam, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Now Gideon had seventy sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son, and 
and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon the son of Joash died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash his father and of Ophrah of the Abizarites. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Bereth their god. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. And did, they did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerob, that is Gideon, in return for all the good that he had done to Israel. So we are continuing our series in the book of Judges tonight. Uh, if this is the first time you're watching us, um, or maybe you've missed some uh, s sermons in this series so far, you can always go online to our website and download uh, any of the talks from Judges. Uh, if you're going to listen to one, I would recommend listening to the first, just because in that first message I give an overview of Judges. And uh, that's pretty helpful to look at, to have when you're looking at a book, particularly a book like Judges. Now, last week we looked at chapter 7. And we saw, we saw God work uh, in an amazing way through Gideon. He took this, this guy who was a doubter. He was from the weakest uh, clan in Manasseh. And uh, God took him and he used him to save Israel from the Midianites. And it was a massive success. Uh, did you notice how many men um, Gideon lost in that battle? He lost none. So of his 300 men, he kept 300 men. It was a, it was a massive success. But the, the question we're left with at the end of chapter 7 is how did Israel respond to this success? So God gave it to them, amazing success, but how did Israel respond? How did Gideon respond? How did Israel respond? Did they uh, just take the credit for themselves as God warned them about? Did they give God the glory uh, as they were meant to? What, what, what happened? Uh, well, that's what this chapter is all about. If you like, um, if you're one of those people who like to kind of replace the subtitles in your Bible, uh, this one would be a good one to replace. Uh, Zeba and Zelmuna is not a very enlightening title. Uh, and maybe you want to replace it with something like this. Israel's response to God-given success. Israel's response to God-given success, because that's what this, this chapter is all about. And uh, look, I think it's a very relevant passage for us to be thinking about today. Uh, by God's grace, he gives us successes. Um, God works through us like he worked through Gideon, not in the same way, but he works through us and he gives us successes in life. And we all have stories of successes. You know, whether that's getting a job or passing an exam or winning a contract or discipling our children, uh, we all have successes in our life. Uh, look, if someone ever tells you I'm a complete failure, uh, tell them they're lying. They're not. Um, they're a complete liar. Uh, because in God's grace, we all succeed at times. And by God's grace, he gives other people success as well. But how do we respond to this success? What does success do to us? When we succeed or when we see other people succeed, what does that do? You know, it's a really important question. You know, the great test of a person's character may not actually be in how they handle failure, but how they handle success. Success has a way of revealing character, desires and motivations like not much else. How do you respond to success? What does success do to you? Well, that's what we're thinking about tonight. And I really think God wants us to think about this. Um, so let's pray and then we'll, we'll get stuck into it. Lord, we, we come to you very needy at the moment. Lord, we thank you that we get to live in your kingdom, but we're, we're novices and we want to know what it 
does mean to live in your kingdom and what it does mean to be a disciple of Jesus. And we pray that you would show us this through your word tonight. We pray, Lord, that your word would examine us and would even pierce us where we need to be pierced so that we can lean more on your grace and so that we can change our lives for your glory. Uh, please help me, Lord, to be faithful to your text. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I said, God um, gave Gideon success. Um, but when we come to the start of chapter eight, there's a little bit more work to do, just a little bit. There are two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, who, who got away. And they really need to be put to death. I, I know that sounds you know, pretty harsh, but um, back in these times, these kings really needed to be put to death. Because if you didn't, what would happen is that they'd probably regroup, form a new army and retaliate against Israel. And the oppression would happen all over again. So what Gideon does now in chapter eight is he goes on this mission to um, track down Zeba and Zalmunna and to put them to death. But as he does, he comes across a few obstacles. And the first of these obstacles is Ephraim. Ephraim. Now, who is Ephraim or who are the Ephraimites? They are a tribe of Israel. Uh, they are one of the strongest tribes of Israel, both uh, economically and militarily speaking. Uh, so they're a very significant tribe. And they have, they have got a problem with Gideon. And this is what it is. Verse 1. The Ephraimites asked Gideon, why have you treated us like this? Why didn't you call us when you went to fight Midian? And they challenged him vigorously. Now, this is pretty serious stuff. Um, it says here in the NIV that they challenged him vigorously. In the ESV, it says they accused him uh, fiercely. Uh, this is not just a squabble, a little squabble between two guys. This is one tribe against another. This is big stuff. And as we read this, we kind of get the feeling that if Gideon doesn't navigate this well, it could end up in civil war. But why? I mean, why would the Ephraimites have such a beef with Gideon? What's Gideon done? I'll tell you what he's done. He has defeated the enemy, the Midianites, who were oppressing the Ephraimites. Gideon has liberated Ephraim from the worst oppression that ever faced in the land of Canaan. And Gideon did it without losing men. So why are the Ephraimites now all of a sudden angry at Gideon and probably ready to shed blood? Because they're jealous. It's as simple as that. They're jealous. You see, the Ephraimites, they wanted to be the ones that God used. Not Manasseh, not Gideon, but them. They wanted to be the ones who defeated the Midianites. They wanted to be the ones who, who wore the badge of honour. But, you know, God didn't choose them and they can't handle that. You notice, you might have noticed from last week that they had a part to play. It says here in verse 24 from chapter 7, Gideon sent messages throughout the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites. And they went down and they fought. But for them, it wasn't soon enough. They wanted to be alongside Gideon holding those torches and trumpets. They wanted to be the first tribe out fighting against the Midianites. They weren't. And that's a blow to their pride and they're jealous. Now Gideon manages to calm the tensions, but how does he do it? He has to tell them how good they are. Like he has to give them the glory that they want. It says in verse 22, Gideon said to them, he said, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't the gleanings of Ephraim's grapes better than the full grape harvest of Abizar? Gideon has to tell them how good they are 
to satisfy their ego. And isn't this sad? This is, it's tragic. You know, God has just performed one of, one of the greatest miracles uh, in Israel's history so far. He's, he's freed them from the worst oppression in Canaan through one man and Ephraim spits the dummy because, because God didn't choose them. They're meant to be on the same team. They're meant to be working for the same goal, but they're just jealous and it's sad. Now, what do you think God is telling us about the Ephraimites here? Is it because their response is actually a very common response? When I think about the Ephraimites and how they responded to Gideon, you know who I think about? I think about the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees responded in almost exactly the same way to Jesus. The Pharisees, they knew that God was at work through Jesus. I'm, I'm convinced of that. They had to know that God was at work through him. They, they saw the miracles. They heard his teaching that it was like none other. They saw his way of life. They knew that God was at work through him. But they killed him because that's not how they wanted it. The Pharisees, they wanted God to work through them. Right? They were meant to be the ones who bring in God's kingdom. That's why they were so religious because they thought that by obeying God's law, they'd bring in the kingdom. They were going to be the heroes of the story. But instead, God doesn't use them. He doesn't bring in God's kingdom, his kingdom through the Pharisees. Instead, he uses Jesus from Nazareth to do that. And they couldn't handle it. And so they killed him. It was jealousy that got Jesus killed. It wasn't blasphemy. You know, I know that that's what they say, but the real reason behind it all, is that they're just jealous. They were jealous. We even see this similar kind of thing among the 12 disciples, don't we? You remember what the disciples argued about most? About who was the greatest. But, you know, sadly, it's, uh, we see the same kind of jealousy still today. And even in the church, we see denominations get jealous of other denominations when God works in that one and not that one in the same way. We see churches get jealous of other churches. We even see jealousy like in a local church. And I know this because it's so easy to spot, isn't it? You can always tell if someone's struggling with jealousy because they're often critical of others, particularly when other people succeed. They, they find it really hard to celebrate with other people. Other people have got good news to share, and, but they don't, they don't celebrate in that. And they often try and pick holes in what other people have achieved. Do you know people like that? Are you someone like that? Are you a little bit like the Ephraimites and the Pharisees and the disciples? Do you find it hard to accept that God works through others and not just you? Do you find it hard that God would give other people success, other churches, other ministries, other mums, other dads, other businesses? Do you find that hard to accept? You know, I, I do. Sometimes I do. I would be a liar if I said I never got jealous of another church or another pastor. At, at times I feel very much like these Ephraimites. But here's the thing. Because of the gospel, we've actually been freed from jealousy. And because of the gospel, we don't actually need to be jealous. We don't. In a soccer team, do you think a goalkeeper ever gets jealous of his own striker when he scores a goal? Do you think that ever happens? Do you think that when the striker scores the goal, the, the goalkeeper gets all mopey and upset? Of course not. Because they're on the same team. And when the striker kicks that goal, the whole team benefits. Well, the gospel has put us all on the same team. Through Jesus Christ, we are all one in him. We are now one body. All the denominations in the Christian church 
a part of the one body. We're in the one church, we're on the one team. And we're all going for the one goal, God's kingdom and God's glory. There's no reason for us to be jealous. In fact, I would say jealousy is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Just as how ridiculous it is for the Ephraimites to get upset with Gideon, it's, it's just as ridiculous when we in the church get jealous of other people or other churches. So friends, when you see God work through others, don't be critical, rejoice, celebrate. Don't try and pick holes in their success. Don't get bitter and upset that he didn't work through you and he chose him or her. We're all on the same team working for that one goal. We don't need to be like Ephraim. And uh, just before we move on, let me give you one real practical tip that I found quite helpful in um, just dealing with jealousy. Next time you feel jealousy, tell someone. Okay, if you're starting to feel jealous about somebody else, tell someone. Um, why? Because when you tell someone, of your, you share someone about your jealousy, you have to f- come face to face with how ridiculous it is. You know, often when we um, try to cover up our jealousy and don't let anyone know, um, we think it's more reasonable than what it actually is. But actually when we have to verbalise it and share it with someone, uh, we have to come face to face with how ridiculous it is. And that is a great help in and of itself. And uh, by the way, if anybody shares with you that they're feeling jealous, you just have to ask them one question. Just ask them, what do you think God thinks about how you're feeling right now? Get them to think of things from God's perspective. Ask them, what does God think about how you're feeling? Well, when it comes to success, there's one other angle we need to think about. And that's how we respond when God gives us success. Okay, we've thought about how we respond when other people succeed. How do we respond when God gives us success? And that's what the remaining passage is about. And uh, look, I know we've only got through three verses, but trust me, this won't, this won't take long. Let me give you a summary of, of what happens after this. After consoling the Ephraimites, Gideon continues to pursue these two kings. And as he does, he has to pass through two Israelite towns, Succoth and Peniel. And in each town, Gideon asks them for some bread. So he's 300 men, they're hungry, they need some bread. So he says, give me some bread. Uh, Which is not a very big request, is it? Doesn't take much to feed 300 men. Bread. But they both say no, just a flat out no. Now, why would they do this? They're probably worried that Gideon might die um, on his way to kill the kings and the kings might regroup, retaliate. And if they're found to have helped Gideon, guess who's gonna get in trouble? So they say no to Gideon. How does Gideon respond? Gideon just flips his lid, doesn't he? He just loses it. Gideon promises Succoth and Peniel uh, that he's going to punish them. And later, that's exactly what he does. After capturing the two kings, Gideon comes back. Uh, He first of all goes to Succoth and tortures them by tearing their flesh apart with thorns and briars. I don't know if you can imagine that. I can't imagine that. I don't know what that would look like, but certainly sounds uncomfortable. And then Gideon goes to Peniel and dies even worse. He tears down their tower and then he just slaughters all the men of that town. The husbands, the fathers, just all of them, just slaughters them. And these are fellow Israelites. Now, what would drive Gideon to do such a thing? Why would Gideon torture and kill his own people over some bread? You know why? His success has gone to his head. Clearly his success has gone to his head. Gideon was outraged he didn't get bread because he felt like he was entitled to it. He felt that 
He deserved honour and he deserved respect. After what he had just achieved, he deserved to be treated like a hero, not an enemy. And when he wasn't given these things, honour and respect, he was outraged. His success has clearly gone to his head. And if you think I'm overstretching it, uh, look at what happens next. It, It gets worse. After killing these two kings, Gideon sets himself up as a king-like figure in Israel. He sets himself up like a king, like a king-like figure in Israel. Talk about letting success go to your head. Uh, look, look at verse two, 22, from verse 22 with me. The Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your son and your grandson, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor my son rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Now, that's a textbook answer, isn't it? Doesn't get better than that. Look, I'm not going to rule over you. God is going to rule over you. I'm not going to be your king. God is going to be your king. It's a textbook answer. But here's the problem. He doesn't believe it. He says it, but he doesn't believe it. How do I know that? Because for the remainder of his life, he lives as though he is Israel's king. It's exactly how it lives. Firstly, Gideon asked for a financial reward um, for delivering Israel and only kings would ask for such a reward. He becomes very rich um, like a king. He then takes for himself the ornaments, pendants and purple garments worn by the kings of Midian. So what is he doing? He's decking out his wardrobe, fit for a king. Third, he makes an ephod. um, And it's a little unclear what that ephod is, whether it's a a garment worn by priests or whether it's some sort of image that he sets up. But at the very least, it becomes an object of Worship, And so what Gideon really does is he starts this new cult and leads Israel in worshipping this image. And that's something that kings do. Kings lead nations in worship. And finally, Gideon gets himself a harem full of wives and concubines and it pumps out 70 sons with his wives, which again is just very king-like. So he, he says here, I don't want to be your king, but his life tells a different story. In everything he does, he behaves like a king. And we've got to ask, what happened? What happened to that guy threshing wheat in the wine press? You know, the man from the weakest tribe of Manasseh. What happened to him? I'll tell you what happened, success. Success happened to him and it went straight to his head. Made him feel entitled to honour and to respect. And it ends badly for Gideon. Gideon himself becomes ensnared by this ephod and the whole nation goes astray. Now, sadly, um, Gideon is not the only one in the Old Testament who let success go to their head. In fact, if you look at uh, many of the kings in Israel, Saul, even David at a time, many of the kings, they just let success go to their head. But what's truly remarkable is that when you come to the New Testament, you come face to face with a leader who never let success go to his head. You know, Jesus was the most successful person who has ever walked this earth, hands down. He did everything right. He said everything right. He thought everything right. He was was the epitome of success. And yet Jesus, he never let it go to his head. There were times where the crowd said to Jesus, be our king. And Jesus just walked away. He refused. The devil 
even offered Jesus the kingdoms of the world and Jesus refused. Jesus could have worn a crown. He could have set up an empire. He could have overthrown the Romans. He could have sat on the most glorious throne on earth, but he didn't. Instead of wearing a crown of gold, he wore a crown of thorns. Instead of sitting on a Roman throne, he, he let himself be hung up on a Roman cross. Jesus never let success go to his head, never. And the question I have for you is, who are you more like? Are you more like Gideon in this story or Jesus? When you succeed at something, do you feel the need for recognition? And do you feel the need for honour and respect? Do you feel a growing sense of entitlement? Or do you remain humble like Jesus? and continue to serve others and put them before yourself. Well, again, the gospel helps us with this, doesn't it? Not only because the gospel gives us the example to follow, but the gospel, it already gives us the, the value and the honour and the worth that we crave. Through the gospel, we are made children of God. We are made citizens of heaven, and that without doing anything. This is a free gift that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. I don't know if you know it, but you have a worth and an honour that is unspeakable because you are God's child and you are part of his kingdom. Which means we don't have to be successful for ourselves. We don't have to be successful for ourselves. And this is liberating. As Christians, I think we should handle success much like, much like a child handles a helium balloon. What does a child do with a helium balloon? Let's it go, right? Child just wants to see the helium balloon go. And uh, even if it doesn't want to, it just, he just, um, little child just lets it go. That's why we tie it around the wrist. Well, as Christians, I think we have to treat success the same way. We just got to let it go. We succeed, we celebrate, we worship, and then we just let it go. We don't hold on to it. You know, we don't post our successes on Facebook and then check it every 10 minutes to see how many likes we've got and how many comments have been made. Instead, we, we succeed by God's grace, we celebrate, we worship, and then we just, we just let it go. I think that's what this chapter is teaching us. We shouldn't be jealous of others when God gives them success. And when God gives us success, we shouldn't let it go to our head. And only the gospel can truly help us in this. You might remember at the start of this series, I said that Book of Judges is uh, a dark book. Well, it's about to get dark. Uh, next week, we're gonna look at the story of Abimelech, Gideon's son, then Jephthah. Things are gonna get dark. Uh, but as many have pointed out, darkness just makes the light seem brighter. And I'm convinced as we, as we tread through the, the dark chapters of Judges next week and the weeks after, we're going to see the light of Christ um, very brightly. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for working in our lives. We thank you for working through us. We thank you for all the successes you give us, the big successes and the little successes. And Father, we thank you for the successes that you give your, your, your worldwide church. We just pray, Lord, that we won't be like the Ephraimites who just get jealous and that we won't be like Gideon who lets our success go to our head, but rather we would be like Jesus, humble. Lord, help us to see 
the value and the honour and the worth that we have already in Christ Jesus. Help us to let our successes go and not to hold on to them. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to help us in this and we just pray that he would help us do exactly this. Amen. We are going to... Um